Okay, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the talk I gave, uh, in fact, yesterday, uh, March 22 in Munich, where there was this uh, acute leukemia number 18 meeting. This is a classic meeting that is held in Germany. And obviously, the last few years have changed because of the pandemic. So this was the first gathering again. And I must say, it was extremely well attended. Many speakers from different parts of the world, many from the state. So high standard. And I was asked in a session at the end, in fact, was the last session on my audio treatment strategy in ALL. And the title they gave me was I'm reading. So chemotherapy, free therapy, to be the same title. Any, anyhow, strategies in ALL. So chemotherapy free. Well, this is something that only a few years ago would have been totally unrealistic. But now it isn't. It's something that changed completely. And clearly my talk, the 20 minutes I had, was focused on Philadelphia positive ALL because we have to talk about a group of ALL patients where a chemo, and I would add a chemo and transplant free strategy is a realistic option. This is exactly for the Philadelphia positive ALL. So I focused it on that. Although at the end I did mention in a slide on, let's say, precision medicine in ALL, saying that probably with the new approaches now, we will reduce chemotherapy and the number of patients are going to be transplanted even outside of the Philadelphia positive ALL. But if we talk about really free, then it's a strategy that uh, possibly, or probably in fact, has a role in the Philadelphia positive ALL. So what did I do? I I mostly spoke of the approach that we took in Italy through the Italian Copy Study Group for Adult Hematological Patients, which is a Jumema. And I recall that over the last 20 plus years, so in fact, we started a protocol in the year 2000, so to this new millennium, and right at the beginning of the century, we started the first protocol for elderly pH positive LL patients where we did not gave chemotherapy induction, we gave the first tyrosine kinase inhibitor that became available. So the whole story started at the end of last century, in fact, when we started thinking that based on data that had been obtained with imatinib, which was the first TKI in CML, and since uh, uh, the most frequent genetic lesion in adult ALL is indeed the Philadelphia chromosome, so the similar mechanism that uh, is a founding lesion in CML. So we thought, why don't we try applying uh, the first TKI also in Philadelphia positive ALL? So we did this first protocol in adults, in elderly, sorry, patients, for the very simple reason that it was a major change to consider not giving a chemotherapy to a ALL patients. However, since the Philadelphia positive ALL in those days, in the era of pre-TKI, did very poorly, very, very poorly. And since in the elderly, most patients just got palliative treatment, it was ethically acceptable to offer a strategy without chemotherapy. And indeed, the protocol was written for patients over the age of 60 with no up age limit, and it was approved by all ethical committees. So we did the study. And to our surprise, all patients, despite age, the oldest patient was 89, entered the complete remission. I'm not saying they got cured. I'm saying they entered the remission. And I'll tell you a story in a minute, in fact, on this point. So I don't, if I don't remember, you recall me in the question, but there's an important point here. So we did a study, and it was published in Blood. And that was the first of a long story that has gone since. Then we did this protocol with a second generation TKI Dazatim that was for all other patients 18 years up. Again, no up age limit. Then with others, we tested the rotation of inhibitors. <laughs> we tested ponatinib. So we tested them all. And the last study we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that is in October 2020, was a further step, and I think very important step forward, because in addition to induction treatment, we completed that with consolidation without chemotherapy. So induction was a TKI targeted treatment, and this was followed by this bispecific monoclonal antibody, blinatumumab, which is dual, it targets the CD19 on the leukemic B cells and CD3 activating the host immune system in the patient. So it's a form of immunotherapy. So it is chemo-free induction plus consolidation. And the published study reported the feasibility, the results, the tolerability, the easiness of doing this, and the uh, uh, virtually all patients went into remission. And we had at the primary endpoint, we had 60% of molecular responses, which increased further. 
So here in uh, in uh, in here there in Munich, I I gave an update of this, which is not published yet. The paper is written, but it's not sent. There's a long term follow up because in the England paper it was a median follow up was eighteen months. Now we've got a follow up which is well over four years. So it's a so more or less a final analysis of the study, which is the data that we. We gathered in an ancillary GMEMA study where the post consideration treatment, which was left to the centers, was uh, gathered in a in this uh, GMEMA study. So we got all the information what the patient did. To summarize it quickly, I can say that uh, um, what can I say? That uh, the data look very good. The overall survival, disease free survival at four hundred plus years is. Still very good. I won't give you exact figures, not published, but it's well over, well, it's in the range of 75, 80% at eight, at four plus years, which is obviously very rewarding for us. Um, about 50% of patients never got chemo, never received systemic even, even later on on treatment, never got a transplant. So they maintain the disease only on a TKI plus immunotherapy and nothing else. So that gives already an answer to the fact that clearly it shows that many patients with the Philadelphia positive LL, which I, I recall was the worst leukemia you could get, the worst hematological malignancy. The prognosis was dis dis dismal before TKIs. So this is a very strong indicator that you can treat a large proportion of patients without systemic chemotherapy and transplant. And we showed that if you have a very early molecular risk, response you do extremely well we've had no events in these patients we added further information on genetic profile like diagnosis and the transplant we are giving data on a transplant and uh, it the transplant seems uh, i'm not saying not to be useful but seems to be useful only or mainly in patients with residual minimal residual disease positivity so this, I think, is a key point. Now, this study has opened, the result of the study have opened the way to a new protocol, which is ongoing. We already rolled the first 80 patients or so, which is the first randomized study for Philadelphia Pontevilla. And this is a total therapy study. So nothing is left to the uh, individual centers. And here, patients will not get systemic chemotherapy and will be transplanted only if they have mineral disease positivity or additional unfavorable genetic markers. If not, even if they're young, even if they have a sibling donor, they will not be transplanted. Going back to my topic is chemo-free and transplant-free treatment of, uh, a possibility, and, and the answer is obviously yes. We have to see for how many patients. Now, I remember what I wanted to say, and I'll tell you this. I showed a slide in Munich of a patient that we treated many years ago. I've shown this slide many times. Of a gentleman who was diagnosed in 2007, not in Rome, in Verona, and uh, luckily he was tested for this genetic lesion. But this opened a very important point, how, how feasible is all this? It's feasible if you do the testing. You have to identify the genetic lesion in the first week of a diagnosis of acute leukemia. And that is doable in many parts of the world, many in some parts of the world, but not doable in a large majority of places around the world. If you can do it, then it's okay. The other point is that uh, very often in the elderly patients, where the disease is more frequent, I forgot to say, it increases with age. But most elderly patients, if they're, old, if they're old, over the age of 70, 75, they're not tested for this. And if they were tested, they could be controlled with a pill. So it goes to a paradox that it would be a cost-saving approach. In fact, if you did it because you would treat them with a pill, you would reduce your hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera. So the gentleman in Verona, he was diagnosed with ALL at the age of 89 in 2007. Luckily, he was tested for the genetic profile. He proved to be Philadelphia part. He had the BCR but he was given imatinib. He went into remission. He became even MRD negative. He was very, very fit driving a car at the age of 89. He turned 90. Then eventually he relapsed uh, about a year and eight or nine months later. We gave him a second generation uh, TKI. He still responded, went into remission. And the bottom line is that he died uh, uh, after two and a half years. So at the age of 89, he lived to turn 90 and 91 and eventually died. So, and he had two and a half years of a very good quality life despite having an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, if he had been tested for the BCR Abelson, he would have died in a couple of months. So this is to be a practical example.